Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's feature webcast for CSSE's Mental Health Awareness Week. My name is Scott. And I'm Stephen. And today we are joined by our special guest. It's CSSE's very own HR manager, Katie Hamilton. She's here to talk about mental well-being within the workplace. So over to you, Katie, to maybe tell us a little about yourself and what you're talking about today. Sure, thanks, guys. So I'm Katie, I'm the HR manager at CSSE. Today I'm going to be talking to you about HR, HR's role in mental health um, and all things related to health and well-being. Um, but just to give you a bit of an introduction, I've been in HR for 10 years. Um, and I think if you were to ask of any, any HR professional, we'd all say the same thing, that the last 10 months has been the most challenging um, and no one could have ever prepared us for it. Yeah, Katie, I think with everyone, it's, this year has been a challenging year, uh, to say the least. But how has that really impacted uh, yourself and HR uh, departments in particular? Sure. So when COVID-19 hit the UK, all businesses had to make some drastic adjustments to how we could continue to run and manage our business. The role of HR naturally changed dramatically, primarily in that we had to become more reactive than ever to the needs of the business and our employees. So as the UK enters another month of lockdown, the quality of people's mental health is deteriorating at a concerning rate. More than two thirds of adults reportedly are reportedly feeling worried about the effect the virus is having on their life. The pandemic has impacted us all in different ways, meaning the support we provide will differ from person to person. Some of us will feel anxiety, stress, loneliness, frustration, or maybe grieving the loss of a loved one. According to a survey by the Samaritans, over one in 10 callers reported experiencing suicidal thoughts or thoughts of self-harm during the first week of lockdown. It's not surprising, therefore, that such a dramatic change to the way we live has caused extra strain to people already struggling. Mental health charity Mind is defining this as a mental health emergency. And as such, we not only have to prioritise mental health as individuals, but also as a responsible employer. Where do we need to prioritise our attention? As a HR manager, I've had to think differently about my role. The, priori the priorities of the department soon changed from the start of the year, from learning and development, recruitment, performance management, and defining our overall HR strategy, to employee engagement, staff wellbeing, ensuring employees felt safe, whilst responding to a high volume of questions about COVID and how this would impact the business and the implication of this to individual roles and responsibilities. There's no doubt that throughout the pandemic, well-being has been a red hot topic across the globe. But what about well-being at work? While some people have found coping mechanisms to deal with coronavirus related stress, others continue to fluctuate or decline. A LinkedIn poll recently showed that around nine in 10 UK workers were suffering from some level of lockdown lethargy. So I'm now gonna talk a little bit about how HR has provided support um, and some solutions that, that we're currently offering um, and, and would like to offer in the near future. Um, so with face-to-face -face collaboration being replaced with email and video calls, conducting HR business as usual activity has been very challenging. The scope of the role has also expanded to support employees who have been furloughed or made redundant, while also continue to motivate, engage with current working employees so they feel reassured and valued these are all moving parts in the new normal. Yeah, brilliant, Katie. I know you mentioned sort of going on furlough and stuff. I know me and Stephen had a personal experience with that. Yeah. Um, back in April, we, we were asked to go on furlough ourselves uh, from CSSE. And, and I know how it made us feel. Um, what what were those conversations like um, with, with people being on furlough? I know we, we spoke a, a number of times during that point, but how did you find that and, and speaking to other people and their struggles? It, um, absolutely. I mean, at the beginning, it was all so uncertain. I don't think most of the population had even heard of the word furlough. Um, so, so understanding what that meant um, and then impacting on our employees. Um, it was it was um, a very challenging time because you didn't quite know the best practice to be able to advise them either. Um, we just we, you, you watch the news, everyone was watching the news and it just um, it, it did it, it made sense. But in terms of the support you can offer employees, it was just it was so unprecedented. It was just dialing into all those core um, sort of mental health first aider lessons that I'd been trained to do to support people and ensure they could just feel as as supported as they could at the time. Um, and then once furlough had, um, you know, furlough was 
maybe two months down the line, it was really important to keep those key conversations with, with employees and just check in with managers, making sure they're checking in with their employees um, as best as best as we can. Um, but it, it was a challenge because we couldn't really communicate with them. Um, but yeah. Brilliant. So during this time, HR, along with our health and safety um, manager, have successfully ensured our remote policies are fit for purpose, ensuring our employees were set up to work remotely as efficiently and safely as possible. This is something we're continuing to do now. Um, as we've implemented updates to the ways in which we work, offering a kind of flexibility that we've not seen at CSSC before. So these arrangements provided solutions for teams of employees that normally need to work together in producing work, such as CSSC at home and other marketing initiatives. The company also empowered managers with the autonomy to work with direct reports to create schedules that best accompanied their work from home lives. It was important to establish online resources such as Wellness Coach, as well as remind staff about external support that they were entitled to, such as our employee assistance program and our mental health first aiders. Connecting with employees and regular check-ins with managers and staff has been key and continues to be throughout the second lockdown. Employees continue to be encouraged to make use of the 90 minutes wellbeing time that we offer as a core benefit every week. Employees can use this time to um, do anything that is good for their wellbeing, whatever sport, um, obviously within the limitations that we, we now face. Um, so while previous tactics and strategies will continue to be a big part of any HR manager's toolkit to efficiently manage employees, we see a bigger shift taking place in the wake of the coronavirus that will fundamentally change the role of the HR function forever. Yeah, definitely. And that 90 minutes of well-being you mentioned there is is brilliant. I, I know I take real advantage of it um, every single week, whether that's, you know, just closing my laptop down of an afternoon, getting it out with the dog for a walk just to clear my head or or, or anything. We really just even just sitting down with a book and, and just switching off from work for 90 minutes. Um, it, it's really, really good. Uh, and I found it really beneficial for myself. What about yourself, Stephen? Yeah, uh, definitely something I'd, I'd make use of. Uh, each week and I think it was really important. Um, I was going to ask is obviously we, we know about this 90 minute wellbeing time that we do have uh, at CSC for employees. Don't know, Katie, maybe touch on that and let know where this came from and why it was important. Absolutely. So um, I think it was launched over a year ago now, but obviously being within the health and wellbeing sector is the perfect benefit we could offer staff. We encourage everybody to be as active and, and know the benefits of this. Um, multiple studies have been done on the impact of, of sports and physical physical activities. So it was a no brainer really, but it's a, it's a it's an amazing benefit. I speak to other HR professionals and and, and nobody can quite believe that. Um, yeah, and, and it's a really, it's a real selling point as well, I think in terms of the uniqueness of the benefit um, when recruiting um, new people and um, it's, it's really continue. It's, it's proved to be a real success and I just hope, Brilliant. hope it continues. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, so studies are already showing that more and more organisations want more of their on-site employers to continue to work remotely after the pandemic passes. This isn't strictly for CSSE. Um, however, if this is the case, this, this shift will come with its own HR challenges. So therefore, HR will need to continue building and developing the skills we've had to adapt to already. One of the strengths of the HR function is building working relationships remotely, which will be handy in providing advice and help as the nature of work and teams continue to change. It's important to remember, though, that mitigating factors in the current new normal, managers have had to let employees know that these are difficult times. Usually, parents don't have to care for children whilst working from home, and it's important to bear in mind that we're going through essentially a societal crisis, and we should be mindful that this is not remote work as usual. Our number one job in HR right now is to keep people updated, be reassuring, and continue to build trust. Definitely, I know back when I first come back from furlough and the kids were being homeschooled, and, uh, and it was really... I'm not going to say difficult because it was nice spending a lot more time with the children, be, being able to spend that time with them. Um, mm. But but yeah, it is definitely a, a unique time, I think it's fair to say. How, how have you found it, Steve, with, with your daughter? Yeah, um, challenging, having a te especially having a teenage daughter who is still in that phase of, oh, I'm off school, um, yeah. so I don't need to do work. So it was the, the challenge of having to work as well. And 
saying, actually, you've still got your homework, you've still got work to do at home and uh, and be a teacher as well, which I've never thought I would have to do. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Definitely a challenge and something that we've all had to maybe just start getting used to um, right. as well. As you mentioned, it's kind of a almost a new normal. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest things on everybody's to-do list is to get a faster Wi-Fi connection. Now everybody's <laughs> working from home and, and watching Netflix or, or wherever it might be. I think that's certainly at the, the top of my to-do list anyway. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So, but yeah, back over to you then, Katie. Um, so what has changed the most for HR and, and the role that you're going to play moving forward? So what's changed most for HR um, and moving forward is that in our world, the 10 tends to be on remuneration and benefits for a lot of people. However, with the impact of COVID, I, I believe health and wellbeing benefits are going to be a game changer. So the world has seen a lot of change over the past year and with it many new challenges for employees and managers alike. Some of these important issues include reduced social interaction with friends, family and colleagues, greater childcare responsibilities, financial worries, fear of social stigma, less respite, including fewer holidays and less change of scenery, stress related to sensationalised news and rumours, concern over vulnerable family members' health, reduced contact with health services and boredom. And the key concerns reported during this time are worrying about the future, feeling stressed or anxious and feeling bored due to social isolation. Yeah, I think once you've completed Netflix and Amazon Prime once, it's uh, <laughs> it's not a lot left to do at the moment, is it? So yeah, absolute nightmare. But hopefully now with with Christmas coming up, I know you know a lot of the TV stations put lots of movies, don't they, to keep everybody occupied. So hopefully that'll combat that a little bit. Um, okay, cool. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the wellness initiatives that we already have in place at CSSE and some future ideas and solutions. Um, so whenever I'm looking to implement um, a new strategy or, or ideas about things, I'll go to the CIPD. Um, and according to the CIPD, there are seven interrelated areas of employee well-being. And I utilise these, um, as I said, when in implementing a HR strategy for well-being. These are health, good work, values, social, personal growth, good lifestyle choices and financial I'm just going to pick out a couple of those um, to go into a little bit more about. So number one is health. Um, to respond to employees' mental health issues, it was important to make employees aware initially that CSSE, as a responsible employer, have a number of trained mental health first aiders who can help and offer support and confidential advice. Reminders were sent out to all employees about Employee Assistance Programme um, and Crona has proven to be a trustworthy provider and played a part in making this resource widely used. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about values. Um, and so reviewing our company values and our company mission has been important um, and is currently still under review. But doing meaningful work is regularly cited as a critical factor that makes employees happy. It's therefore important for employees to feel part of something and communicating company vision and values is a great way to help achieve this. So fostering a trust culture and in the current situation, we need trust to serve as our foundation in order to support teams with coming to terms with the unknown. As this crisis unfolds, it's critical organisations see the benefits of creating respectful, trusting workplaces and act with more, than, more urgency than before. And from an employee perspective, high trust environments allow people to be their true selves. And when people can bring their whole selves to work, they are not only more creative, but more productive as well. So, Katie, I know you mentioned personal growth um, a little bit earlier. So are there any plans or do you have any sort of ideas that you want to run with uh, moving forward for CSSE? Um, sure. So lockdown has offered an opportunity for people to, to learn new hobbies and um, have some personal growth opportunities. Um, at CSSE, I'd like to implement um, a mentoring scheme um, that would help staff develop both personally and professionally. Um, this is great for both parties and does wonder for well-being. Um, and I think it has has the added benefit of sort of forging social connections that otherwise might not have, have happened. Um, so I can see that being being something positive. Brilliant. Social connectedness generates a positive feedback loop of emotional and physical well-being. It's been important to improve social connection to improve overall well-being. So TED Talk Tuesdays and Webinar Wednesdays were introduced by HR to get staff involved in choosing and discussing talks and topics they were passionate about 
Um, and this proved to be quite successful, um, generating feedback, comments and suggestions from employees across the business. Um, and then the events committee as well um, are currently looking into what events we can host remotely, such as virtual coffee mornings, sporting events and more. Thank you, Katie. And yeah, we've talked quite a bit about obviously you're looking after all employees' well-being, what you're doing from an HR perspective. But obviously, as we all know, is you've also got to look after your own well-being. So how do you incorporate looking after your own well-being when you're looking after everyone else? Sure. Um, I think for me, the number one thing was creating a structure and routine to my day. Um, and from doing that early on, it really helped to um, keep my momentum and, and uh, well-being going throughout lockdown. Um, so I used to be a keen runner. I gave up a number of years ago um, and just did yoga. Um, so for me, not getting to my regular yoga class every day was a real mental um it was it, it was it was a challenge not being able to do that every day um so i've i've sort of built it into my routine but i always start my day with a, a run um sometimes i manage 5k sometimes i manage one but i find that um doing it every day regardless of of, of whatever the weather really helps to um yeah just start start my day in a positive mindset um and helps me to take on other challenges later down the line um fantastic I'll also do a 20 minute guided meditation at lunchtime with inner space. Um, I sometimes find in HR, you, you it's, it's easy to kind of get um, stuck into a million things and not really being able to focus on any one thing at any given time. So I find meditation um, is the perfect way to really focus and, and it helps me to rebalance um, my emotions and take on, take on what's coming for the rest of the day. Um, and then in the late afternoon and evenings, I'll always do um, a 20 minutes guided yoga session, um, sometimes with wellness coach, but um, sometimes with other instructors that, that I know locally. Um, but there's unlimited options out there. Um, and I think trying out some new hobbies as well. I started le um, lockdown learning Italian. Um, wow. I know some basics, but nothing major. Um, and some uh, learned some new dishes, um, how to bake sourdough, sourdough bread. Um, and yeah it's offered a, a bit of a opportunity to do different things so yeah you've uh, certainly got a, a packed schedule Katie, listening to all that. <laughs> brilliant try um but i think that's the, the point working in hr you wouldn't be able to give anybody advice or you'd be a bit hypocritical if you weren't practicing what you preach and yeah um, yeah yeah would from the, from the front absolutely definitely so have you got any advice so obviously the first national lockdown was you know in quite a nice time of the year really wasn't it the weather was just starting to get a bit better um so now going into a winter lockdown where it's not as nice where you can't get outside as much what what sort of advice would you give to people around this time sure um so as we enter the second lockdown in winter it's important to adapt our mental health routine for the new season as days become shorter and gloomier, seasonal affective disorder, otherwise known as SAD, um, can add to the effect of um, people suffering from depression or low mood. Um, so with the colder days and less daylight, there are some steps we can all take to help stay on top of our health and habits every day too. So creating a winter exercise routine, staying active throughout the season is a must. Um, if you wear out, like you say, in the summertime walking, um, it, it it was a, it was amazing to have that and the vitamin d levels and serotonin um really help boost people's well-being obviously in the winter it's a little bit harder so um trying something new maybe this season such as a you know um a new yoga class or kickboxing or dance um anything that releases that serotonin um and anything that works for for the individual really um but um it's important to definitely stay active um, again, I'd, I'd say meditation is really key. When we're stuck indoors and there's nowhere to go, the, the, the quote is to sort of say, if you can't go outwards, go inwards. Um, med meditation, um, I'd say, is key. And it's yet another proven way to improve mood and help us better manage stress. Um, and the best part is that this tactic is free and takes as little as five minutes to get started. So you can meditate doing anything, really, brushing your teeth, cooking lunch, um, getting ready for bed. Um, it's important to also have good sleep habits, um, so setting a be bedtime um, time and sticking to it every night. 
and plugging for at least an hour before bedtime, having a bedtime routine, um, and also getting some light exposure. Um, so even if it is just a short walk, um, the impacts of, of, of that um, is, is really important to get some vitamin D. Um, be vigorous about getting enough sleep and getting good quality sleep. Make this your number one priority, um, as you may see an improvement in mood and ability to do everything else on your to-do list. Um, also, eat healthily, so enjoy mood food. Um, we could all use a mood boost this time of year. Um, so things like nuts, pulses, um, really good, healthy um, things, not too much sugar late at night and things like that because it can, can um, mess with your sleep. But uh, also establishing a social hygiene routine. Um, so ensure you stay connected to loved ones. Um, it might be harder in the winter, especially this year. Um, but ensure that you get to spend some time um, with people in your bubble um, and obviously FaceTime and, and, and keep communication strong with, with people um, externally. Um, our relationships have such a significant impact on our health and winter can leave us feeling particularly lonely. So get ahead of the game, try to pack your calendar with some social engagements for the future um, to feel spiritually and emotionally nourished. Self-care is always important, but this year more than ever, we could all use an added dose. Consider a blend of all of the above tips that I've just mentioned um, to add to your daily routine and find what works for you. Yeah, definitely, Katie. Thank you for that. Some really, really good advice there, I think. Now, you know, me and Stephen this week, um, this whole week really was sparked by an idea around International Men's Day. Um, so it was something that we, that we were chatting about and it was something we really wanted to mark, I, I think, at CSSC, um, because we, we don't think it gets as much recognition as perhaps a lot of the other awareness days throughout the year, you know, and all of those other awareness days are for vitally important course, causes, of course they are, um, but we just feel that International Men's Day needs that, that little boost as well. So what, what's your opinion on International Men's Day and, and HR for, for men's health in general? So poor mental health can of course affect anyone, irrespo irrespective of age, gender or status. But men, especially working those in a macho or competitive environment, can often struggle to open up to say that they need help and support. Fortunately, there are a number of things we can do to make a difference. Tackling how we address male mental health in the workplace is crucial, particularly because men are less likely to ask for help. Research shows that more than half of men suffer from work-related stress, we know that work-related stress can affect performance, with stressed out employees often seem to be less engaged, motivated, and consequently less productive at work. Add this to the fact that work-related stress, anxiety, or depression is estimated to account for more than half of the working days lost due to ill health in the UK, which costs the UK, billion, the UK economy an astonishing £37 billion a year. Researchers found men are more likely to work in an always-on culture and are less likely to have a reasonable workload and working hours than females. So understanding, therefore, that men are just as vulnerable as women to stress, anxiety and other forms of poor mental health is the first step to fighting this battle. Encouraging men to share their problems, specifically in the workplace, will help fortify the future of mental health awareness. It's been proven men are less likely to talk about mental health issues than their female colleagues but that doesn't mean that the problem isn't there. HR need to pay attention to men's mental well-being too. We have a professional duty to put in place psychological safety mechanisms and measures to protect employees' mental health based on analysis and evidence. While analysing workforce demographic comparisons, including comparing male and female employees, are helpful to, com are helpful to highlight key concerns for HR, for example, performance and flexible working. It seems that mental health needn't be split between men and women as it affects everyone. So we can't, however, overlook some stark contrasts finding from a recent report from CV Library. Men are more likely to feel the effects of mental ill health in the workplace than women. And so here are some, here are some statistics. So six in 10 male men feel like they can't talk about their mental health issues with their manager. And four in 10 of these feel their professional abilities will be questioned. These findings illustrate how men are struggling in the workplace. While women also face their own struggles in the workplace, the findings become all the more worrying when we consider two other statistics. So suicide is the biggest killer of men under 45, 
and men are more likely than women to self-medicate with drugs and alcohol. So this isn't about who has it worse, nor does it discount how women are affected by mental ill health, um, but it does have some alarming um, some, some alarming statistics that we, we need to really consider. Definitely. Um, you know, I know. So when we've been researching International Men's Day ourselves for, for the, the upcoming webcast this week, we, we've come across some really alarming sort of statistics across the UK. And I just want to touch on sort of what you mentioned a little bit earlier. There's six in 10 men feel like they can't talk about their mental health issues with their manager. Um, what, what, why do you think that is? Do you think because you have, they haven't got the relationship with their manager or do you think it's because the man feels though he would come across as weak if he did that or what, what, what sort of things do you, do you envisage? I think as you said there is that stigma attached to men being open um, and their communication in the workplace. Um, that's probably the overriding um, reason for not, for not feeling um, that they can communicate. Um, it's about having that um, allowing that openness to, to be there and um, destigmatizing it so as for CSSC um, obviously with men's shed and, and what you're doing this week on men's mental, mental health awareness um, it's absolutely fantastic for um, men to to feel that they can you know be open having said that it is it is an in, innate thing between men and women I think that's this it's never going to go away with yeah. you know men um, feeling they have to have that bravado um in, yeah. in in any situation any workplace so it's something that we just keep working on it um and, and offer the support as best as we can um hopefully we'll start to to see some progress that that's really good katie so no, we, we've spoken about what we're doing at cssc to try and encourage men to open up and talk but from a HR perspective and what sort of advice would you give any other organisations throughout the UK um, to try and encourage men to communicate and, and open up? Sure, um, I think currently what, what we're doing, things like Mental Health Men's Awareness Day and Week, such as what we're doing, um, helps to destigmatise um, men's mental health, um, to offer open communication um, across the business, so whether that be um, from from managers and, and if and people aren't able to talk to their manage, managers establish exactly why that is um, but having like an open forum um, where whereby people can be anonymous if they want as well um, we do have sort of an anonymous inbox and things like that if people do want to reach out for advice but I think that's that's important that people necessarily don't don't want to kind of um, name themselves if they do have issues um, so I know, Katie, that here at CSFC that we've developed a, what we're calling a main shed, uh, an evening where the main at CSFC can get together just for a moment on a virtual basis uh, and just talk about anything that we feel we need to talk about and kind of open up in a safe space. But is there anything else maybe uh, HR, uh, like yourself, could do specifically around mental health? Okay, so government initiatives attempting to close the gender leadership gap are proving successful, albeit with much more work to do. While senior positions are still male dominated, um, so too is the reinforcement of the macho bravado. The image of a kept together strong and mentally, mental, mentally capable leader remains dominant. So by closing the gender leadership gap, male leaders can learn from their female counterparts and their coping mechanisms. For example, speaking up more openly with managers, colleagues and friends. We should also be conscious of perceived gender norms when developing policies that potentially dissuade men to speak up. For example, sexual harassment can happen to, to and originate from either gender, yet media and HR policies, um, and they slip into the habit of being gender specific. Other policies and organisational practices perpetuate male specific stereotypes. For example, the lack of flexible working opportunities for men and non-enhanced paternity leave are both organisational decisions yet they severely impact on new fathers who struggle to spend quality time with their children, their partner, and to meet parental demands. This can then result in further pressure for fathers to maintain their bravado, despite the stress they are experiencing, as there is a greater demand for them to keep their job, and in some cases, be the main income provider. Whether that pressure is enforced internally or externally, or a combination of both, is pressure nonetheless, and it's a pressure that men are finding hard to cope with. We should of course consider mental health however from all perspectives and we need to be conscious that it affects 
all people differ differently as individuals, regardless of gender, but sometimes because of their gender. Wow, thank you, Katie. Some some real good advice, some really deep sort of thoughts, not just from a HR perspective, I think, but just in general, just for everybody to, to really think about. Now, if you were to, I don't know, summarize everything that, that you've said today in, in, in a few sentences, um, just like the, the highlights, what, what would those be? Sure. So I think the pandemic has taught employers um, that the mental and physical well-being of our employees is of utmost importance. Yeah. As we've had to adapt and navigate through a worldwide crisis, many people have felt worried, demotivated and unsure of what the future holds. Mm. In these current times, one thing is for certain, we are living in times of change and uncertainty. It's important to remember that any change process is a challenge for all employees' mental health. The important thing is we are prepared with change so we can balance some of the obvious stressful aspects by ensuring decisions are communicated effectively and support is made available both within the workplace and an emphasis on maintaining and supportive positive mental health and well-being. Yes, thank you Katie for, for all these thoughts uh, and also for, for joining us today. Uh, I think it's been really worthwhile. Uh, talking on this webcast. Um, as you know, obviously we talked about it throughout this, it's International Mains Day this week and something we've been asking all our viewers, uh, or guests I should say, um, is who your who is your biggest male role model uh, and, and why? So I'd say I'll, I'll give you a personal one and a professional one. Okay. Um, I think um, for me, Roger Federer is my my role model. I think he's a fabulous role model in sports. He's very consistent. Um, I think he he's a, he's he's very calm and he's got a great presence about him. Um, and he always maintains that professional professionalism um, in in all his matches. And um, been following him for a number of years. So I'm definitely a fan of Roger Federer. Um, I'd say my dad um, is probably my role model um, personally. He's um, um, always been there, um, even though he was sort of posted abroad a lot when I was growing up. Um, I always had quite a strong relationship with him and, and continue to now. Um, so, yeah. So my Perfect. <laughs> so th thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, Roger Federer brilliant, like, like you said, consistent and, and the, the, the picture perfect sportsman, if you like, isn't he? I, I don't know anyone that doesn't like Roger Federer, mm. to be honest. He, he's one of these, he's the nice guy in sport. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, definitely. So, no. Brilliant. So that just leaves us to say to all our viewers today, thank you very much for joining us. We yeah. do hope that you got some real insight into HR and mental well-being from Katie. Um, Thank you very much for joining us as well, Katie. Um, we You're hope welcome. you we didn't scare you too much <laughs> during it and uh, and throughout the we the webcast. I've been Scott Thorne. I've been Stephen Toms, and thank you for everyone for joining today. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye. Thanks, guys. <laughs>